Thank you for viewing this presentation on the $850 million Senior Secured Private Activity Revenue Bond Financing for the Alabama Department of Corrections Facilities Project. I'm Steve Howard with Barclays. We are the lead manager for this issuance. Approximately $600 million, depending on pricing, will be sold into the public 144A market with the balance being sold into the 4A2 market. First, before we get into the presentation, I would like to cover one housekeeping matter regarding the disclaimer on the following page. If you've been invited to participate in this electronic roadshow, you should already have been provided with a copy of the preliminary official statement. The electronic roadshow must be read in conjunction with the preliminary official statement, including all information incorporated therein by reference. Investment decisions relating to the bonds should only be based upon the final official statement. Page one presents a summary of the offering. The Public Finance Authority of Wisconsin will serve as the conduit issuer for the bonds. Public Finance Authority is a nationally based conduit issuer for public and private borrowers financing large infrastructure projects. Government Real Estate Solutions of Alabama Holdings, a wholly owned subsidiary of Core Civic, will be responsible for construction and maintaining the project for the life of the financing. The Alabama Department of Corrections will be responsible for operating the facilities and managing the inmate population. As I previously stated, our expectation, depending on pricing, is approximately $600 million will be sold into the 144A market to qualified institutional buyers, with the balance of the financing being placed in the 4A2 private placement market. I'd now like to introduce Damon Heininger, who is the CEO and president of CoreCivic, and he will introduce the CoreCivic team on page two. Thank you. Thank you so much, and special thanks to Barclays team, and, and and also thank you for listening to this recording and looking at this presentation. I am Damon Heinegger, President and CEO of uh, Core Civic. I'm going to introduce our really tremendous team here in a second, but let me just first say this is a really momentous time for both the state of Alabama and their Department of Corrections. They are doing a really transformative solution for their Department of Corrections, and we're excited to tell you about it here in a few minutes. But first, a bit about me. I've been with the company about 29 years. I've been in my current role as CEO about 12 years. And you might find it interesting, I actually started with the company in 1992 as a correctional officer in a company-owned and operated facility in Lovemore, Kansas, where I was born and raised. But I'm joined today by three terrific leaders for CoreCivic, first of which is David Garfinkel, who is our Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. David has been with us for almost 20 years and is a really wonderful leader for the organization. Lisa Beth Mayberry is also joining us today. She's our Executive Vice President of Real Estate. She has been with us since around 2003, but has headed up our real estate department since 2015. And she truly is the leader on this project, has really put a lot of time and effort to help state Alabama with this really transformative solution, Department of Corrections. And then finally, Alex Sherling has joined us on the call today. Alex is the man behind all this uh, work here, helping us figure out ways to finance this really amazing development program that's really going to get the Department of Corrections in a better situation, not only for their facilities, but also get them out of a lot of oversight they're seeing with the uh, federal courts. Again, we'll talk about that more in a minute. So the bios are on page two, and now I'm going to go to page three and just get a quick summary of the uh, the table of content, first of which is just a project background and overview, and then we'll go through some key project parties, which will start on page seven. Appropriation overviews on page 12, facility lease overview and key credit considerations on page 14, and then finally a finance plan overview. So we'll be tag teaming along the way with uh, various folks here on the call to talk about these different areas. Let me now direct your attention to page four, and this is a very good summary of the Alabama Correctional Facilities. So Alabama Department of Correction is taking a really bold step, both at the DOC level, but also with uh, Governor Ivey, to completely transform their system. They have about 15 major correctional facilities in the uh, state at the moment, and there on the right, you can see a map of the location of many of those uh, facilities. 
But what they have determined as a very good way to help transform the system and really modernize their facilities is going through a procurement process to solicit bids for three brand new facilities. These three facilities will be about 10,000 beds are going to be put the Department of Corrections in a position to close over half of their existing facilities. So close some really old antiquated facilities with these new modern facilities and transform it in a way to where it's not only a much more safer, more modern environment, but also have the appropriate real estate and infrastructure to help support services like medical and maintenance and food service, but also for programs. So it can help people get either through academic programs or vocational programs. So we're very excited with these three facilities that were put out to bid to be selected for two. We're really, really grateful for the opportunity to be part of the public-private partnership with the state of state of Alabama. And they really bring their facilities and their entire system up to more modern standards in an operating environment. So with that, I have the good fortune now to turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Beth Mayberry. Lisa Beth. Thank you, Damon. Looking to page five, I will touch on a few of the project objectives that we have for this project. As Damon noted, in order to address the overcrowding and poor facility conditions, ADSC initiated a procurement process in 2019. The goal of this procurement was to seek the private financing, design, construction, ownership, and maintenance of three facilities totaling 10,000 beds. These beds will be operated by the state through the Department of Corrections. The procurement allowed any developer team to win no more than two of the three procured facilities. The core civic team was awarded two facilities. 7,000 beds in total. Construction of these facilities will serve as a key element of the state's comprehensive plan to address the issues in its correction system. At this time, the state's prison system is in the midst of class action lawsuits and a DOJ action. The new, modern facilities provided under the procurement are designed to provide better living and working conditions for staff and inmates, appropriate physical plants for medical and mental health services, and space to support programs and education. The procurement clearly laid out expectations of the design, facility function, and long-term maintenance. These facilities are designed to remain physically sound and operable well past the 30-year lease term. Looking to page six, we mention the two facilities by name, the Elmore County Correctional Facility and the Escambia County Correctional Facility. Both of these facilities will be located on private land acquired by Core Civic specifically for these projects. The facility in Elmore County will be the larger of the two facilities and will contain the medical, mental health, aged care, and reception for the state. It will house a male population. The Escambia County facility will also house a male population and it will be located in close proximity to an existing facility in Escambia County. The 7,000 beds provided by these facilities will be designed and constructed with an approximate 42-month overall time frame, and lease payments will be made through annual legislative appropriations. The construction process for these facilities is mostly made off-site by precast providers and will be assembled on-site. Given this simple construction method, we believe that the 42-month overall time frame is readily achievable. Looking to page 7, CoreCivic interviewed and considered Alabama-based contractors across the state, and we ultimately selected Cadell Construction. They are a Montgomery-based contractor with strong corrections experience. They will be partnered with DLR Group, they are a leading justice architecture and engineering firm with whom CoreCivic has decades of experience and RNN, a leading designer of correction systems with both Alabama DSC and Core Civic Pacific experience. This team will work in close connection with Alabama Department of Corrections throughout the design and construction process, ultimately owning the facility, which will be operated with day-to-day -day operations by ADOC and maintenance continuing to be performed by Core Civic. Damon, with that, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lucy Beth. And I'll direct your attention to page number eight, and this just gives a good overview of Core Civic. 
So Core Civic, founded in 1983 in Nashville, Tennessee, we do three things. First of which is what we call Core Civic Safety, which is where we own and operate prison, jail, detention centers, and we're focused purely on the United States. We don't do anything internationally. And this is where the company is founded. This was the first solution that we did for government when we founded the company back in 1983. Number two is Core Civic Properties, and this is exactly what we're talking about with this transaction. So the Alabama solution would fall in our Core Civic Properties line where we're providing solutions for places like Alabama and Kansas and California and Kentucky, given the mission critical properties that really help modernize our correctional or criminal justice system. So this is a growing part of our business. We're excited again to not only add Alabama, but have good success on other development projects around the country. And then finally, of course, of a community is our last piece. And these are facilities typically in metro and areas that are housing individuals in the last six to 12 months before release called halfway houses or community corrections by other names, but they're really, really great facilities helping individuals in that last six to 12 months before release, getting them gainfully employed, reunified with family, and just helping them with that last step out before reentering into society. So safety, properties, and community, all three lines, probably obvious already that uh, all of them work with government. So we're exclusively a government solutions company with all three lines. So we're very proud of the work that we do here. And we really think, especially with number two of the properties line, we have a big competitive advantage. Not only do we bring our know-how and how to build facilities, in fact, actually, no one's built more prisons or jails or tent centers in the United States than Core Civic in the last 15 years. So we know how to deliver the product really well. But with our safety experience, we also know how to design them very well. We know what it takes to make sure to design them in a way to where it's safe, got all the appropriate lines of sight, it's all the national standards, but it's also very efficient from a staffing perspective. So with that, I have the, now the good fortune to turn it over to my other colleague, David Garfinkel. So Dave? Thank you, Damon. And I'm on slide nine, and I'm going to be reviewing a snapshot of the four correctional facilities in our property segment that Damon just mentioned on the previous slide. So starting in our California City Correctional Center, that's actually the first prison facility that we converted from one that we own and operate to one where we just lease it to the state of California. We signed the lease with the state of California in 2013. It's about a 2,600 bed facility. It was previously occupied by two federal customers, U.S. Marshals and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, but had the idea when California was at 200% of capacity to team up with the union in the state of California to lease this facility to the state to provide them with instantly 2,600 beds of additional capacity to help them relieve their overcrowding situation. Right before we commenced the lease, we did some renovations to meet their needs and quickly put that facility online and commenced the lease for them. A few years later, in connection with the renewal, we also installed a new camera system and built a new standalone medical unit in 2015. Our North Fork Correctional Facility was also another facility that we were operating for numerous customers. In fact, prior to 2016, when we signed the lease with the state of Oklahoma, we operated this facility over its lifetime with nine different customers. And in those situations, we were operating the facility for those nine different customers throughout its history. Like I said, before it converted to a lease agreement where the state of Oklahoma operates that facility today under a lease agreement. And then moving all the way to the right, Lansing Correctional Center is probably the facility most comparable to the Alabama facilities that we're talking about constructing and managing for the maintenance services. In 2018, we were awarded a contract to construct this new facility, which replaced a facility in the state, their largest adult facility that was over 150 years old. So we constructed this 2,400-bed facility for $155 million. It came in $4 million ahead of budget and actually a little bit ahead of schedule when we placed a 512-bed medium security complex online in December 2019 with the rest of the facility and a 1,920-bed complex coming online on schedule in January 2020. Then the last facility that we leased is leased to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. That's kind of listed in the footer on slide nine. We used to operate this facility for the Commonwealth of Kentucky years ago, but it was another one that we converted to our property segment, signed a lease, and that lease commenced in July 2020 after we did some renovations during the first half of 2020 to suit their needs. So with that, turn it back over to you, Lucy Beth. Thank you, Dave. Looking to page 10, we have a little further breakdown of the Alabama system. As Damon noted, they operate approximately 15 facilities that hold around 20,000 inmates. 
ADSC is a department of the state of Alabama, and they are backed by the state's strong ratings. ADSC receives its operating funds through the annual appropriations process. The lease payments for these two facilities will be included in this appropriation process. ADSC has developed and published strategic goals. These new facilities are listed as stated key elements in successful execution of the strategic plan for the Department of Corrections. The facilities that are currently operated by ADSC and are listed on the right side of the page are slated to be consolidated and either shuttered or used for specialty populations when the new facilities are ready for occupancy. Male inmates will be transferred out of the existing facilities and into the new facilities being constructed. A consolidation committee is being established to plan the consolidation, shuttering, and allocation of inmate populations. As you will note, the listed facilities are all over capacity and need the relief that these modern beds will provide. I would note one facility, Holman, has experienced existing physical plant failures that have resulted in immediate reductions of the populations held there. The current female facilities and the population in those beds and certain specialized populations will be managed within this existing system until plants can be undertaken to replace those beds. Turning to page 11, I would touch briefly on the team that CoreCivic has built to address these projects. The team is anchored by the Alabama-based contractor, Cadell, that I mentioned previously. A key component during the procurement process and selection was that ADSC wished to use Alabama-based partners whenever possible. After interviewing and reviewing the credentials of firms across the state, we were pleased to be able to secure Cadell as our contractor. Cadell won its first correctional contract nearly 30 years ago, and they now have a large correctional portfolio, including such noted projects as the U.S. Penitentiary in McCreary, Kentucky, the Yazoo City High Security Federal Penitentiary, the FBI in Aliceville, Alabama, and the Escambia County Jail Reconstruction. They also have experienced a number of complicated and complex construction projects, such as the U.S. Embassy renovations in Afghanistan and the Enriched Uranium Materials Facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. In addition, CoreCivic has experienced two successful projects with Cadell, and we have several more in the pre-construction phase. As I mentioned earlier, when reviewing the stable of Alabama contractors, Cadell stands out for their justice experience. With more than 15 justice projects under their belt, this project will be with familiar subcontractors, specialized and local, and construction processes and material types that they are comfortable with and have used many times before. Their select projects list on this page shows a few of the large justice projects they have successfully delivered. Turning to page 12, as mentioned earlier, these leases will be supported through the state's annual appropriations process. Certain elements of this appropriations process are key to understanding the security of this funding. The state has two budgetary fund groups, the general fund budget and the education trust fund. ADSC receives its appropriations through the budget, and its appropriations are block appropriations, meaning these appropriations are not line items. Accordingly, the commissioner has large discretion regarding where to allocate the budget dollars. This is critical because the lease payments for these two leases have been specifically prioritized above all other obligations to the full extent permitted by law. This includes other leases the department may have. The state has a strong recent buildup of budgetary reserves and a three plus billion dollar liquidity net in the Alabama Trust Fund formed from oil royalties from the coast. From a budget growth perspective, ADOC experienced a 10% growth in their budget from FY19 to 20, and these leases will reap the benefit of staff savings through overtime dollars and salaries that are garnered as a result of the significant staffing efficiencies provided by the new facility design. A few additional risk mitigants on page 13. These assets are critical to management of the overall system and the satisfaction of ongoing scrutiny. Their appropriations are funded in tandem, which means the legislature must fund both facilities. The leases contain strong non-appropriation language that puts the department at severe risk of losing the capacity if appropriations are not made. The leases further contain 
non-substitution clauses that prevent the state from seeking replacement or utilization of replacement capacity during the life of the lease. Dave, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lisa Beth. So I'm moving over to slide 14, which is picture of the project structure. And while it looks complicated, it actually isn't as complicated as it looks just because it's in parallel given the two facilities. So if you start off at the top with the bond issuance by the public finance authority, underneath that entity have government real estate solutions of Alabama holdings, and then it will have an intercompany loan to each of the party on the left side of that slide, government real estate solutions of central Alabama, which will be the landlord for the Elmore County facility, and then moving over to the parallel right side of the slide, an intercompany loan agreement with government real estate solutions of South Alabama, which will be the landlord for the Escambia County facility. And then between those two entities, you have two identical lease agreements with the Alabama Department of Corrections. We've also showed all the parties that Lucy Beth mentioned in terms of the uh, development team. And then you can see Core Civic of Tennessee LLC on each side. Core Civic of Tennessee LLC is a wholly owned subsidiary of Core Civic and will perform the maintenance services for both facilities. So turning over to slide 15, to go over a review of the facility lease itself, as I mentioned, you've got the two lessors, as I just mentioned on the previous page. The lessee is the Alabama Department of Corrections. Both facilities will be leased to the Alabama Department of Corrections under 30-year lease agreements. Core Civic will be putting in an equity contribution into the facility. And the debt service coverage ratio over the 30-year term has actually been sculpted to a minimum debt service coverage ratio of 1.2 times. The lease payments will be structured so, such that 80% of the lease will be flat fixed for the full 30-year term, and 20% of the lease agreement will escalate annually based on the CPI consumer price index for the increase in maintenance services over the term of the lease. On rents, if the lessor fails to perform or is otherwise non-compliant pursuant to the terms of the lease, the lessee will have the right to abate a portion of the payment, but it's important to note that those deductions will be capped so as to protect the lease payments for the debt service so they can never go beneath the debt service payment. Under termination of prepayment, the borrower does have the right to terminate if the state legislature fails to appropriate funds. There is no termination for convenience clauses, and if the state were to not appropriate the funds, there are remedies. So upon a prepayment event, the lessor will be entitled to a prepayment amount, which in all cases, including lesser default, will be subject to repay 100% of all lesser outstanding debt obligations, including the make -hole. Then beneath that, you can see the events of default for the lessee and the lessor, along with the lease events, and then what happens at the end of the lease, where Alabama does have the right to renew the lease at the end of the 30-year term. Moving on to the next slide, slide 16, key credit considerations. Importantly, this is a lease with the state of Alabama, which has a AA1, AA, and AA plus credit rating, so very solid credit with the state. And the lease terms, as I mentioned, provide significant protections for the lenders, including the protection for payment of performance deductions and repayment of 100% of all lesser outstanding debt obligations, including the make whole, in all situations, including lesser default. The facilities will certainly be essential to the state. So all three new Alabama facilities will replace up to 11 existing ADOC facilities, and these facilities will constitute 40 to 50 percent of the state's rated bed capacity in the state. So certainly critical nature of the asset for the state. The lease agreement also does provide a non-substitution clause so that they can't replace the capacity that we would be constructing for the state. The cash flows availability, lease payments are availability payment, as I described on the previous slide, the structure of the lease payments, where most of it's fixed, 80% of it's fixed throughout the term, 20% is subject to a CPI escalator to recoup any increases in the maintenance expenses that Core Civic of Tennessee LLC will be incurring throughout the term. Deductions for lesser performance failures, again, capped in order to protect the debt service. Moving down to advancement of ESG initiatives. So, you know, ADOC will be the operator, as Lucy Beth described. So they will perform all the functions in the facility with the exception of the maintenance services that the sponsor will provide for Civic of Tennessee LLC. 
its purpose is to provide a better quality of life and a better environment for both the inmates and staff at these brand new facilities. And moving down to construction risk, it's a straightforward construction on a clean site. It's a simple prefabricated construction off-site. We put together the cells on-site, which is exactly how it was done for the state of Kansas. And then finally, 100% of all lesser secure debt obligations, including the make whole, even for failure to achieve substantial completion by the long stop date. Moving over to page 17, I will turn it over to Francisco to review the terms of the debt. Thank you. On page 17, we have a summary of the terms and conditions of the bonds. The borrower will be the Government Real Estate Solutions of Alabama Holdings, LLC. We will have two lessors, one for each facility. The borrower will be the parent company of the two lessors. The bonds will be issued through the Public Finance Authority and offered and sold in compliance with Rule 144A and or Section 4A2. The use of proceeds will be to fund project costs, capitalized interest, debt service reserve, and retain -ish. The ranking of the bonds will be senior secured by the net revenues of the project. The tenor will be 33 years with an approximately 21-year average life. The bonds will be fully amortizing and will have annual principal repayments sculpted to achieve a minimum 1.2 debt service coverage ratio. Bonds will be subject to an optional redemption at a make whole price and also an extraordinary redemption at a make whole price upon certain prepayment events described in the official statement including a prepayment event in the event of failure to achieve substantial completion. The bonds will be secured by the bondholder collateral as described in the preliminary official statement. Project revenues will consist of lease payments received from ADOC pursuant to the lease agreements. The restricted payment conditions are several are listed here. Importantly, the occupancy must have occurred before any distributions, number one, and also there's a restricted payment test of 1.1 debt service coverage ratio. We will have a reserve equal to six months of principal and interest. We will have a standard construction security package and a life cycle work reserve account. On page 18, we have the cash flow waterfall during the maintenance period. It's a pretty standard project finance waterfall. The two things I'd like to highlight here is, number one, the lessee will make monthly lease payments directly to the collateral agent, who will then deposit those payments into the revenue account. And number two, if there's a deficiency on any given month, the collateral agent will fill up the lessor expense account ongoing financing fees, and interest and principal accounts first. On page 19, we have the current plan of finance sources and uses. Sources on top, as previously mentioned, the plan is to have a 144A series, series A, and a private placement series, series B. These are all subject to change and will be pricing and market dependent. There'll be an equity contribution by the project sponsor and some interest income that will fund the project and all the uses listed at the bottom. On page 20, we have the payment mechanism and debt service coverage ratio. At the top, we have the annual lease payments. We have it broken out by the fixed component and the indexed component which will be approximately 20% of the overall lease payment and will be indexed to inflation. And you can see the cost resiliency of the project in the red dotted line in the graph. On the next page, we have the pro forma projections. You can see the revenue components, the fixed and indexed portion of the lease payments. And you can see then the routine maintenance costs and life cycle costs and SDV and insurance costs projected over the operating period. As previously mentioned, the debt service coverage ratio will be sculpted and the projected results are at the bottom. 
finally, on page 22, we have the preliminary timeline. We mailed the preliminary official statement yesterday, March 31st. We'll begin having conversations with investors today. We have reserved certain time slots with management, and management will be available for one-on-one calls with investors as requested. We expect to price this transaction on or about April 15th with a closing schedule for April 29th. On the next page, you have the contacts for the various initial purchasers. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.